Okay, uh, welcome to the second day of the workshop and the first speaker is Kostas Kenderis and he will tell us about holography for n equal one, uh, su uh, super quantum field theory. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this nice uh, conference and also for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, it's the first time I talk in this amphitheater. I do have fond memories from my graduate student years in one of the high CTP summer schools, and it's nice to be from this side of the audience. Uh, I also like to encourage discussion during the talk. It's very early in the morning, and if we start discussing, everybody is going to wake up. So um, <clears throat> let's start. So uh, as everybody here knows, the best understood holographic dualities between uh, n equals 4 super young meals and ADS 5 plus 5. And since the very early days of ADS CFT, it was a significant amount of effort was, was devoted into obtaining dualities with less supersymmetry and not conformal symmetry. Uh, so what I will do today is I will try to address some of the same issues that were discussed uh, 20, 25 years ago, but now a bit more systematically. So I will, I will address this issue systematically for n equals one deformations of n equals four spring and mills. And many of the things that we'll discuss have generalization in, 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 in other dimensions or with theories with less supersymmetry, but I will try to stay with the cleanest possible setup. So see how far we can go. And then towards the end, I will analyze the simplest case of this class of theories, which is the n equals one star superior Mills theory. Okay, so before I move on to the discussion, uh, what the references, so this, the, the first part will be based on a paper with uh, my student, Stanislaw Smith, that uh, should appear hopefully this month. And the last part, uh, which is about the n equals one star and the uplift to 10 dimensions, will be based on the paper that appeared uh, last month, uh, plus ongoing work. And I should also say that it was a work that appeared simultaneously by Nikolai and his collaborators, Nikolai sitting there. And uh, I encourage you also to read both papers and discuss the both of us. I should also say that many of these things uh, is based on work done many, many years ago, and, and uh, I would have needed many slides to put all the references. So here I just list some names, and uh, so many of the things we will discuss is based on things already done 20 years ago, but there is something that could not have been done 20 years ago, and this is the last part of the talk, because at the time, while people were expecting that uh, Maxwell's supergravity theory in five dimensions is a consistent rotation of type 2b. It, w it was not known whether this is actually true, and also the actual formulas was not known. This, this, long st uh, uh, this, this problem was, was finally solved a few years ago, and we're going to use the formulas that uh, they, they obtained in this paper. So I also like to encourage people to kind of look at this paper and use this, because a lot of interesting physics can be extracted using these this uplifts, as I will argue in this talk. Okay, so now the outline of this talk is that we're gonna give a longer introduction first, then I will discuss how to reverse the logic. So usually, at, at least, uh, let's say in the beginning, one would start from the supergravity in five dimensions and try to learn things about quantum field theory, and often these computations will be very challenging. But at least some of those you can actually circumvent by if you understand well enough the quantum field theory, you can actually go the other way around and get information about the supergravity directly from quantum field theory. In particular, we'll see that we can obtain the potentials, the relevant potentials from the supergravity theory with a very simple argument. And then after that, we'll pause and then start discussing this classification of n equals one deformations of n equals four spring young mills. And finally, we we'll go to the simplest case, which is the n equals one star theory, the GPPZ solution, and it's uplift, and I'm gonna give a summary of the properties and a few words about the outlook, and then we'll conclude. Okay, so any question on the generalities before I move to my introduction? Okay, so um, let's move to the introduction. So now let me briefly summarize the basics. This should be very well known to the people that grew up in that period, but some things are forgotten as people move on to discuss other things. So how do you go about 
obtaining non-conformal dualities if you know maximally prismatic conformal ones. So first of all, knowing that there is an ADS-CFT dual means in particular you understand how to map the operators from one side to the other. And the operators that we understand best are the half BPS operators. And this half BPS operators, the holographic duals are bulk supergravity fields of specific mass which depend on the dimension of the operator. So this formula here is for scalars, but the discussion is more general. So if you start, if you only want to do supergravity, the only thing you have access to is this half BPS operators. All the other stuff you have to understand uh, kind of by extending the duality to string theory, which is still in its infancy. So now suppose you have an ADS-CFT dual, like n equals 4 being mills and ADS-5 equals 5. Then the next step to go is to go to uh, a quantum field theory, and to do that is you can, you can just deform the Lagrangian of your theory by adding, deforming it by one of these operators. And to do that, what the, the, the thing that you require to do is you require to turn on a field with specific boundary conditions. So if this is a scalar field of dimension delta, then you require that uh, the boundary condition should be of this form over here. And then the coefficient of this term is just the, the coupling, the new coupling in your Lagrangian. Now, once you have that set up, so you have your supergravity theory that describes gravity coupled to a scalar field, this specific scalar field, then the next step is to find supergravity solutions with that admit these this boundary conditions. And now this gives you the deformed the theory. So that's the strategy. So the strategy was very clear kind of shortly afterwards, the ADS-CFT conjecture. Okay, a few remarks. So first of all, in general, the randomization group flow, so once you put this operator here, then the theory will start running, because it's not formal anymore. And generically, this will reduce further operators, making the problem pretty much uncontrollable, at least in generality. So to avoid such issues, one often considers single scalar truncations on the supergravity side. Now, truncations, consistent truncations on the supergravity side means that on the quantum field theory side, these operators close under OPs, so that at least the subsector where the dynamics is controlled just by this, the, the, the fields that we, keep, that we kept. So now, once, so now we need to have single scalar truncations of supergravity, and then starting from the full theory, the maximal the supergravity theory, you need to find a way to extract what is the dynamics of that subsector. And this means in particular extracting the potential for such truncations. So this is really an art on its own and often requires Herculean efforts that only a few people on the planet can do. And this restricts a lot of what you can do because it's very difficult to extract the potentials and therefore find the solutions. So people from there on kind of move to kind of, most people move to bottom-up approaches. You just postulate the potential and then you see what you can get. Now suppose you, you found the potential, the next step is to find supergravity solutions with these boundary conditions. This will give you some information about the system, but not all information. Ideally, one should uplift this back to 10 dimensions because this is the 10 dimension solution that encodes the information about the entire system. Good. So what we're going to do in this, uh, in this talk is we're going to try to focus on simple enough cases so that most of the steps are tractable and we can understand them fully. So we'll start from non-normalization theorems and supersymmetric quantum field theories. This will give us exact results about specific randomization group flows. And then we will use gauge gravity duality to geometrize these results. And finally, use the framework of, say, fake supergravity, which I will explain, to obtain the, the corresponding potential. So instead of kind of doing the hard work on the supergravity side, here we're going to use the fact that we have a control about the specific normalization group flow, and this will allow us to extract the potential and go back to find the full dual. Okay. Yes. Yes. So 
Yes. Um, they are not actually, they, they, they are not general rules. It is just, it's, it's case by case. It, it, it just, it, it so how, in some cases, there are global symmetries that tells you that certain coefficients are zero. And most of the cases where consistent truncations were found were found using this, this kind of symmetry arguments. There is uh, some singlet under some symmetry group, and you know that this singlet is not going to mix with something else. And then I can use the same argument on the other side. So you have some operators that transform under some symmetry groups, and then the symmetry can allow you to kind of select which operators can appear on the right-hand side. Um, I think in all non-consistent truncations, there is an underlying symmetry behind it. Um, yes, I, I don't know any counterexample. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows a counterexample to that. So. Yeah, that's a little bit more general. Yes, yes. Yeah, some underlying structure that... Uh, but I think in general, the other, let's say from the QFT to gravity hasn't been used so much. Kind of, you see what you know from... Uh, I mean, we used it in one paper where we, we studied massive truncations. And there, the, the, uh, the guiding principle was indeed, you know, what happens on the QFT and therefore some massive field. And you will see here, I'm going to have a few more examples where you expect uh, new truncations that doesn't look pos possible a priori. But the kind of field theory, the, the dynamics suggest that it uh, should be possible. Okay, any other question? So what is off-shell potential? Off-shell means I don't evaluate it on the solution. Real, the, the, the actual potential, yes, the, the full potential. It includes all dynamics. <clears throat> okay. It would be, let's say, from the way I derive it, it would look like I have only the on-shell potential, so I put the comment there to uh, uh, discriminate between that case. So. Okay, so how do we go from quantum field theory to supergravity? So let me now first kind of give you a little bit of a longer introduction about these holographic RG flows. Uh, now, first on general grounds, you expect that the solution should have the form indicated over here, which is often called domain well type. So you expect this because you know the quantum field theory should only have one array symmetry. Uh, so this, this part here should be flat. And then as you go to infinity, where the conformal boundary is, this factor here should approach this R, so that this metric becomes a yes. And then this scalar field, as I discussed earlier, should have the boundary condition I indicate over here, with encoding the deformation. Now there is uh, a similar case where if the RG flow is not driven by deformation, but you are in a different vacuum, you have a condensate. Uh, so for instance, in n equals four superior and mills, you can see it in the Coulomb branch. And then in that case, there is a similar discussion where now the scalar field, instead of having this fall off behavior, it has that one. And then this case describes a QFT with condensate, where the coefficient, this coefficient there, is now proportional to the condensate of the corresponding operator. Okay, that's the setup. Now, suppose we have a holographic RG flow, which means a solution of this type exists. Now, there is a simple argument that leads to first order formulation. So if it happens that this field is invertible, then this implies there is a first order formulation given by these two equations. This equation here is actually what defines this, what is called a fake super potential. So if you, again, suppose you have, you know the existence you, you assume the existence of a holographic RG flow, therefore this function exists. Then if you take its derivative and you evaluate it, then you invert the scalar field and you put it here, this gives you this potential, and then automatically the scalar field satisfies the second one. Okay, so now that's a very simple diagnostic. Suppose you got, you uh, 
obtain your solution numerically, then if it is monotonic, then that would exist, and then this would imply the corresponding first order equations. And then that automatically implies that the potential is given in terms of this W, which is obtained via this root, via this formula. Now, this discussion here has been run in many different directions in many different ways. So the same system you can also get by the Hamilton Jacobi theory. And the same system also follows if you have supersymmetry. And then W is the actual superpotential that, that governs the, the, the supersymmetry of the system. But this discussion does not assume uh, any supersymmetry. Now, why? And then also some people use this as a differential equation to find W, which is, of course, it's a very hard job because this is now a partial differential in general is, is a complicated nonlinear uh, differential equation. But here, this, this is a very simple construction that only uses kind of the fact that this is invertible. Now, if you have a theory, a gravity theory with such a potential, there are a lot of nice things are happening. So, for example, this theory is a joy, a positive energy theorem. And now it turns out that uh, the solutions that saturate, that have the lowest energy solutions of the system, are precisely the solutions that satisfy this equation. So these domain wall solutions are the lowest energy solutions are allowed among all solutions with the same boundary conditions. And then this implies that this solution here is stable at the perturbations, both at the small perturbations and under some additional assumptions also non-perturbatively. So you kind of gain a lot of mileage out of this. Now, but we're going to use this, this, this formalism in, in a kind of inverted way to try to get the potential from the actual solution. So let's see how this goes. Now, in holographic RG flows, the beta function is related also to the, this fake superpotential via a formula, via this formula over here, where R is now associated to the energy scale of the quantum field theory. Suppose now we know the beta function exactly. Somebody gave it to us, and we'll see examples in a minute. Then one can just combine the ingredients we just had, these two equations together with this one, and then I get an ordering differential equation for the superpotential as a function of R, which can be very easily integrated. And here's the formula. And again, combining the equations, now you get an equation that relates phi with W. And now we already solve for this. And then we can obtain, we can just solve for the scalar field. And now if we invert this relation, now we solve it, we invert it, plug it back here, and then we get the superpotential, and then we plug it back here, and we get the potential. And this argument could have been written down 20 years ago, and I don't know why nobody has written it, but it's very simple. You just combine the equations. You have three equations in hand, and just combine them. And then you quickly get the, the potential that governs the dynamics. So, to summarize, yes. Uh, you mean this one? Yes. Well, this one is again comes from intuition that uh, the, um, the TT component of the metric with the appropriate redshift measures the, uh, it's, it, it's, it's giving you the energy scale of the theory and then you just combine the ingredients. You can view it, I view it as a postulate rather than, uh, and then what I'm gonna discuss from here on and says provide support to this postulate. So it depends on which, which dimension it is. I will discuss many examples as we, as we move on. So this here, again, you have, if you, if you look back in my, so you start with a scalar operator that has this mass. Then you know there is an operator of dimension delta. And then you run this, this argument. And then the, what, is, what would be running is, is the running of this coupling. Now it's not the running of the gauge coupling, which sits in here. It's the running of the deforming operator. Okay, so to, um, 
summarize this part. Given the beta function, we can obtain the potential. That's, that's the slogan. So one, do we actually know the beta function? So that's the next question. So before I move on, any more questions? Okay. So now suppose you have supersymmetric theories, and supersymmetric theories, I mean, the oldest of the, we know that um, the oldest of the non-normalization theorems tell us that uh, there are no corrections to the superpotential. So suppose we modify the superpotential by just deforming it with a carrier superfield. Okay, then the beta function for this operator will be given by this expression. So there are some parts because this is the classical dimension of the deforming operator. And in general, they can be, the, the, the operator can have an anomalous dimension. So, so that will happen if there is wave function normalization of the fundamental fields. So there, will not, there are not going to be any corrections to the superpotential, but if the fundamental fields, if you need to do wave function normalization, that would reduce some anomalous dimension to the operator and then would modify the beta function. Now suppose, in addition, that this operator actually has, has anomalous, has protected dimension. Then this part goes away, that's zero. And now this equation can be readily integrated. And this is the solution. Again, associated to the associating the radius with the normalization group scale, and we see that this is the beta function. So here's an example where we actually know the beta function exactly. So what happens if we now use this beta function in the formulas I gave you earlier? Okay, that's what you get. This is the superpotential, and this is the potential. So then one can ask, has this superpotential and potential appeared before? And the answer is yes. There are many, many cases, and I will review one of the cases as we move on. So explicit realization, when this happens, so consider again line equals four super young mills. It's half EPS operators have no anomalous dimension. Now n equals four super young mills can be expressed in n equals one language. And some of the half EPS operators are actually F terms from the perspective of the n equals one theory. So now the, the point is to deform n equals four using any of these operators. Okay, so and that's what we're gonna do. Good. Any questions? Yes. So in this case, nothing is running, so there's, there's no scheme dependence. Yes. So there is scheme dependence. So once you start moving to more and more complicated cases, there are questions of scheme. There's also questions. What is the precise identification between the radial coordinate and the normalization group scale? All of this are there. And, uh, and I think the literature is a little bit uh, kind of um, not very clear. I would kind of start from like, kind of the best understood cases and move progressively to more and more complicated because then you're gonna meet kind of less kind of complications and resolve them as, as you move on. I think that there would be issues to be resolved. Yes, any other questions? Okay, so, uh, so now this leads us to kind of the main part of the talk. So we need to understand n equals one deformations of n equals four spring young mills. Okay, so first let me remind you that uh, the Conan of n equals four spring young mills in n equals one language is, is, is three chiral multiplets z sub i and one vector multiplet. Once you write the theory in n equals one language, the R symmetry group of the theory, which is SU4, SU4 is now broken to SU3 cross U1. And then the action take the form I indicate over here. So as in all n equals one systems, in a sense there are three functions to give. One is the Kähler potential, which for n equals four is given by uh, kind of a trivial kinetic term. Then we have the gauge kinetic function, which in this case is also a trivial, it's just the, uh, the, 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 the gauge coupling with, with the theta angle. And then we have the user superpotential. So now the 
question I want to ask is how do we deform each of these three cases using half PPS operators? So here's again. So if we want to study holographically n equals one theories, then we have to, the only thing we can do is use half PPS operators in our disposal. There are other deformations which are not, one cannot study using holography, but if we want to use the, the, the usual tools, then that's what we have. So we need to identify which parts of half PPS operators deform the superpotential, the gauge kinetic term, and the Kähler potential. Now, once you go, you, you, you broke supersymmetry, you go to n equals one, then the bottom components of Kähler superfields may condense. So if you want to study those holographically, we also need to identify where this component sits in a half PPS operators of n equals four schmier mills because this would give you a holographic access to this information. So I think the main message of this talk is that we have classified all of these cases. Now, if I had uh, maybe two hour talk, I would have gone through slowly in all details. So I'm not gonna give you all the details. I'm gonna give you a sketch and a feeling of how it goes, but the actual paper would contain all cases, okay? Question. Yes. So if you want, so basically this program now I can go and do for Clevon of Wheaton. I can write the Lagrangian. So you mainly know the field theory Lagrangian. I know the field theory. I know what happens in the field theory. And I know exactly how to identify which fields are turned on on the supergravity side. And I will try to make this a little bit more clear in the next few slides. Okay, so let me, uh, first a quick reminder about how PPS operators of any portfolio of young mills. So the super performer primaries are given by the symmetric traceless combinations of the traces of the six scalars. So phi i are the six scalars. And then the rest of the half PPS operators are obtained uh, as super conformal uh, descendants. If you put P equals two here, then this is the energy momentum multiplet, and this corresponds to the gauge supergravity multiplet. If you look for P greater than two, then uh, this corresponds to kaluza klein modes on the five sphere. Now, the uh, structure of this multiplet has, has been fully understood. So here I give it for the P equals two. So in general, for general P, so P equals two, P equals three are special. For P equals four, they form this kind of diamond shape. Then you start from the, from, the, from the top, from the super conformal primaries. So for P equals two, this is again phi i, phi j, and then you move down by acting with supercharges. So here in the boxes, I denote the SU4 representations, and then in the brackets, it gives you the, the Lorentz uh, indices. So this is a scalar, this is a fermion, this is a self dual form, a scalar, and so on. And you fill up all the multiplet. Again, P equals two and P equals three are special, P for P equals four are generic. Now, the way the mapping is happening in the bulk is like putting them, stacking them on top of each other. So you start with P equals two, which is, so this is the multiplet I just described. And then P equals three has this shape, P equals four, then it's the full diamond. Then you stack them on, and then corresponding to each of them, if you go vertically up, you have the kaluza klein modes from the various 10-dimensional fields. So then you know exactly where things appear. So if one tells you that you, know, you want, let's say, you're in P equals three and you want the mode, then you have to look at the, at the, uh, under the, the bottom component of the, the, the undersymmetric tensor in 10 dimensions and so on. Okay, so we know how to go from the SU4 for, for the Cairo from superconformal primaries to uh, supergravity. But now, what we're interested in is again, we're interested in doing the n equals one problem. So the next thing we need to do is we need to kind of break the representations from the SU4 to SU3 cross U1. And here I give you the corresponding kind of branching ratios. So the, the 20 is decomposes into six bar, eight, and six and so on, how they act. So now we understand and assess how they decompose. We still now need to organize them into n equals one multiplets. And we know how to do this. We know how to cover all of this with n equals one multiplets. 
but in particular, we're interested in this problem of deformation. So we need to identify F terms, D terms, uh, kind of the, the gen genome multiplets and, and, um, and uh, the condensates. So for that, you need to do then uh, the composition with, um, in, in, in chiral superfields. Uh, for, for just chiral superfields is very simple. You just need to go kind of to the left. So this is, this is a chiral superfield starting from Z square. And this is the top component. And you can do this now with all the multiples. So now let's now analyze in a little bit more detail this case because it's the simplest case where everything sits within supergravity. So in this case, we start with a chiral primary. So first I go to this complex basis. So this is ZI, ZJ. And then I supersymmetrize. And then I turn this into superfields. So the superfield is, has this is the bottom component. I have a fermion and then the F term. So now what we want to do is, again, we want to deform the superpotential. So we're interested in turning on a term of that type. OK, so now if we put it in, now, if you do n equals 1, it's off shell, so there are auxiliary fields. And then you need to integrate them out. So that's an additional complication. So once you integrate the auxiliary fields, you get the Lagrangian of that form. So now I deform the theory. So I have the n equals 4 Lagrangian plus these two terms. Here, there again. So this first term in red is what we wanted to do. So we wanted to add a mass term for the scalars. But now, because we integrate out the auxiliary fields, we automatically generated an additional term. And this additional term, in terms of, um, kind of SU3 representations, it has a, a component which is in the 8 and a component which is in the 1. And actually, the 8 is part of the 20. So here, if you see the decomposition I had over here, so the trend that decomposes to 6 and 8 and 6. So the 8 that we get here is this 8. So uh, if I just do this, do that, and then I need to include two bulk scalar fields. So I also have to turn on the scalar field that corresponds to the 8 of the 20. But then this is going to be a two scalar case. And I want to be as simple as possible. So we need to project out this. And one can project this out by considering this matrix M, which in general is symmetric traceless. Uh, uh, it is symmetric. Just consider the diagonal elements. And if, you, if, 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 if the diagonal, this projects out the eight. Now there's still an one, and this one is the Konishi operator. Now in the supergravity limit, the Konishi operator decouples. So it's not going to be visible. So we don't, ha we, we don't have to worry about the, uh, the, the Konishi. Although this may be related to the fact that we see later that the actual solution is going to turn out to, to have a naked singularity. So to, to really describe the system, in principle, we have to have access to the Konishi. OK, so now to summarize, if we're interested in the n equals 1 star theory, which is the theory with three, three equal masses, then uh, the only thing we need to do is we need to turn on this operator where the, the, the M is diagonal. So now we have a case with a single, a single scalar. And we know this is consistent of its own because from the quantum field theory answer. So now I can use what I did earlier because everything I said earlier now exactly applies to this case. And Planck delta equals 3, d equals 4 to the formulas I had earlier. And this is the formula for um, the superpotential. And this is the formula for the potential. That's precisely the superpotential and the potential, which is which worked out by GPPZ with a lot, a lot of work. We actually spend a lot of time reproducing the potential the way they have done it. I mean, this would require, I would think, a two-hour lecture to explain it fully. And then here comes for free. It also tells you what is the physics behind it. So the physics behind it is that it says there's only classical running. 
Now, for general P generalizes, so the story is very similar. So you start with now the full diamond. And if you want deformations of that form, so this is superpotential deformations. And again, uh, this is the, the, the corresponding superfield. All of these are Kaluza Klein modes, which are associated with, uh, uh, with the undersymmetric tensor with the legs on the S5. The details are very similar to the P equals 2 case. And like in the case of the P equals 2 case, when you integrate out the auxiliary fields, you get a lot of extra terms. In this case, it was just one term, but you get similarly many other terms. And in all cases, there is precisely one of those is Kara primary. So the generic case requires two scalars. But you can always arrange so that you project that additional uh, scalar out, and then you're left just with the, the one that you want to deform the theory. So this argument suggests that there exist massive single scalar consistent locations of type to be supergravity with the potential that they gave earlier. So that's a challenge for the supergravity community. So now let me briefly discuss the other cases. So now if you want to deform the, um, the gauge kinetic function, then you, the corresponding uh, F term comes from here. So now you start from, from this knot and you move down. So if I now start with, uh, <coughs> so this is going to describe this kind of deformation. So that deforms the, um, the function from just the, the gauge coupling to d to the p minus 2. And again, you can discuss all of them. So that would be very interesting to kind of analyze combining with kind of diagram alpha technology from 15 years ago. Understand the beta functions and so on. But we, ha we haven't done that. <coughs> and finally, a few terms about D-term deformations. Clearly, D-terms are a lot more com uh, possibilities. Uh, the terms of deformations appear only for uh, p greater or equal to 4 when the, we have the, the, the full diamond in the representation. And one result that I would like to point out is that uh, there is a class of deformations which is characterized by a harmonic function, namely a function satisfying this condition given by this expression. So that's a general result. So if, if you do a d term deformation, of n equals form to n equals 1, it would be characterized by this, this, this general function. And again, this, I think there is a lot more room to be analyzed, a lot more room for, for, for analysis. OK, so now let's move now to condensates. Now, n equals 4 speaker mills does not have vacuum that spontaneously break n equals 4 to n equals 1. However, if we first deform the theory to n equals 1, then there would be condensates. In particular, for the n equals 1 star case, we know that the condenses, condenses have the form I give over here. So this m here is the deformation I discussed earlier. So the, the condensate is related to the mass of the, um, oh, 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 the, the mass of, of, of the theory. And there is this exponential factor here that, that comes from non perturbative effects. But now in the large stuffed limit, if you take strictly uh, the lambda goes to infinity, this factor just goes to 1. And we're left with w squared proportional to m cubed. Then this implies that there is an RG type equation for the condensate, which is given over here. And it's the analog of the RG equations I was discussing earlier. And then one can run, again, the same argument I had earlier, where I derive the potential from the RG equation. And in this case, the effects per potential is this one. And then you can combine it with the effects per potential we obtained earlier to get that one. And from here, you can get the potential. And that agrees exactly with the GPPZ result where they derived the potential for the, for the entire system, the M and the sigma field. And again, this clarifies what is the underlying physics behind these potentials. And here, you get both of them with an almost back of the envelope computation. OK, so what I'm going to do next is now I'm going to focus on the GPPZ solution and discuss its uplift. Any questions? How do you fix hmm? 
sigma I got from, uh, so sigma is the field, which is due to the operator W squared. And so now if you go back to, uh, think the difference between the two RG flaws is in this kind of different behavior. And that translates to, uh, you can get the same formula as you had earlier, but you take D minus delta to minus delta, and that gives you the formula. So if you do this replacement in this formula, that gives you the formula for the condensate. It is really completely analogous. You follow the same steps. The only difference is you trade delta for D minus delta. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't really. I mean, it's clearly a lot of things to analyze in these cases. Uh, and now we have access to this holographically because some would be sick, or uh, there were. Hmm? I don't know. I, 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 have, I haven't analyzed those. Yet. Any other questions? Okay, five minutes for the uplift. Um, okay, first, let's go back to the GPPZ solution. So the equations are actually, these first order equations are very simple, and they can be solved by terms of elementary functions. Here is the solution. So M and sigma are the norms of the complex sources, actually that's one of the questions I had for many years because from the quantum field theory it was clear that you need M and sigma to be complex, but the actual supergravity had the real fields. And it wasn't clear for a long time, at least to me, it wasn't clear. Is it the real part, is it, is it the norm and so on? It is actually the norm of the complex sources. Uh, but now this solution actually has a naked singularity now, if one uses Gupser's criterion, then the singularity should be, should be um, acceptable if so we have C1 and C2, two integration constants, and if they satisfy this relation, then they're acceptable according to um, Gupser's criteria. Uh, but of course, okay, this is more a diagnostic, I think, one needs to kind of go deeper to understand whether the singularities are physical or not. And the solution was proposed to be dual to one of the confining vacua of n equals one star. I mean, n equals one star has a rich uh, vacuum structure, which I don't have the time to review here. In particular, there are confining vacua, and then these authors here, one of which is Sao Chair, uh, will propose that this should be dual to one of the confining vacuum. Now, in quantum field theory, as I said, the complex are complex. So, as a first step, and it's, and it's clear, this, this, this phases do play a role. So, we need to generalize the solution to include the phases. Secondly, in quantum field theory, as I reviewed earlier, in the limit of infinite top coupling, the condensate should be proportional to the mass uh, cubed, where m is, again, the deformation parameter. Now, in gauge gravity duality, we expect such relations to come from a regularity of the solution. However, for no choice of the integration constants, the solution is regular. So that points out towards that perhaps the solution is unphysical. And there is also a computation from 2000 where they actually find a massless state, which is, contradicts the claim that this is a describes a confining solution, so perhaps the solution is dual to a Coulomb vacuum of the theory. Finally, there was a proposal for a 10-dimensional dual of n equals star by Puczynski Strassler, which looked quite different from what we had over there. So, and for, for a long time, there was a question, what is the relation to GPBZ, if any? Okay, now, to address some of these issues, one really needs the 10-dimensional solution, and that was not possible for a long time because we didn't know how to do that. Although I should say, Christoph was sitting there, they had an enormous progress around 2000, they almost got it. So sometimes the singularities in lower dimensions are, are resolved if we go to higher dimensions. 
And furthermore, the 10-dimensional solution contains a lot more information than the five-dimensional one. In particular, one can uh, extract the values of higher primaries due to kaluza klein fields, and that will help understand the physics of the solution. And also having directly a 10-dimensional solution should allow us to kind of compare with what puczynski strassler did. So as I said earlier, the D, D equals five maximum gauge of gravity is a consistent location of type to bishop gravity with very explicit formulas for uplift provided here. So that's what we did. So uh, first we generalize the GPPZ solution to complex M and sigma and then uplifted this general solution to 10 dimensions. Now it turns out that the phases of this complex fields are, um, in the beginning it, looks, it looked uh, surprising. I think, it's, I don't think it's as surprising anymore, but in any case, here it is. So these phases are counted by combination of a rotation in S5, which corresponds to an R symmetry transformation from the quantum field theory side, and a rotation of a U1 inside the SL2 of type 2B. From the quantum field theory side, this U1 is what the delegator called bonus U1, which is only present in the infinite uh, Taft limit. Uh, so the 10-dimensional metric and action did a lot of it agree exactly with what Christoph had with, uh, with, um, with Warner in 2000. Now, now we have also all p-forms. All p-forms are turned on, and then that solution is not that complicated. It's always given in terms of elementary functions. In our archive submission, we also provided a mathematical file with a solution, so if you wanna play with it, uh, it's all there, or if you wanna check again and satisfy Einstein's equations, you can, you can look at the mathematical file. So I'm not gonna flash the, the, the solution. I'm just gonna describe some of its features. First, singularity. So the singularity is exactly as it was described in this 2000 paper. So first of all, the solution is still singular in 10 dimensions, but the singularity is milder in 10 dimensions than in five. So in particular, there is either a ring singularity in the internal space on the S5, if C2 is less than C1, or there is both a radial singularity and an angular singularity if these two are equal. So I think this, is, this looks to me more singular, so I tend to think the actual physical case is this one. Um, but uh, there is a curious observation that we made in the paper that if one considers different conformal frames, so we have scalar fields which are non-trivial, so a dilaton and an axion. So in general, you can consider a new metric which is rescaled by these fields. Then uh, one can make the metric almost completely regular. So for the case C2 less than C1, one can arrange so there is a singularity only on one point and it's five and it's regular everywhere else. And then in the case of C1 equal to C2, one can arrange that there is only singularity in the radial direction. Now what is the physics of this rescalings? I don't know, I think at this point it's just an observation. So we also looked at the near boundary behavior. This is the beginning of understanding how to extract uh, the VEVs for the Kaluza Klein modes. So uh, we find agreement with an earlier work of Friedman and Minahan from 2000 where they did a special case. The boundary conditions that, we, that we're using, uh, namely the, oh, the, 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 the non-normalizable modes are exactly the same with what Puczynski and Strassler use. But the splitting terms are different from those of Puczynski and Strassler. And this implies that what they give as a solution actually doesn't solve the equations of motion. So I think that puts a big question mark about the validity of, 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 uh, of, of, that, of that solution. Okay, so, um, so what is next? So now we have the 10-dimensional solution. We explicitly check the type 2B equations hold at generic points, but they can be delta function sources. A solution may be supported by brains. And checking for those is clearly much harder. And to diagnose for possible data function sources, one may integrate the field equations against test functions and integrate overall space. So if there would be 
not delta function sources, so that should give zero. If the delta function sources, one should get something which is non-zero. Okay, so we're currently doing this. This is the results we have up to this point. First, there are definitely no seven brains into the system. So uh, I think Christoph and, uh, and, 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 and Warner speculated about the, that the solutions may, may, may involve seven brains, but it's definitely, uh, there's definitely not seven brains. There are no sources for seven brains. There are also no five brains localized away, away from the position of the 5D singularity. But there may be five brains localized at the position of the 5D singularity. That we have, an, uh, we, 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 we still have to, to, to complete the analysis here. But um, so they're still, they're still open at this point. And there's no, it doesn't seem also there are any, any other brains from the ones I list over here. Okay, so the outlook. Okay, so we need to compute further observables to, discard, to, 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 to decide what the solution represent. Perhaps it's unphysical, or perhaps it represent some of the other vacua of n equals one star. It's not clear at this point. And one way to do this is to use this program of Kaluza client holography that allows us to extract the vacuum expectation values of the color primaries, which are dual to Kaluza client fields. And then you can compare with quantum filter expectations depending on what vacuum you have to see whether you get the same or, or something different. So that's kind of the outlook of that. Okay, so any questions on this? So next I'm gonna have one slide of conclusions. Yes, yeah. So let me, so uh, I, I, I summarize the status of the last part. So now, now let me briefly summarize the, the first part. So what I discussed today is I discussed how to classify n equals one deformations of n equals four superior mills. We also discussed how to obtain supergravity potential for single scalar sectors directly from the quantum field theory. And this relies on knowing the beta function exactly. So clearly it would be interesting to generalize that to other cases where we understand the quantum field theory dynamics. This results suggest single tra scalar truncations of massive modes, which is surprising from the supergravity perspective, and it should be checked. And also novel truncations that involve just a few fields, let's say a couple of fields. That should also be tractable. And I focused this discussion for uh, D equals four, but uh, most of the discussion extend to other dimensions and other theories. It would be very interesting to do the same for ABGM in three dimensions. For example, the potential for D equals three and delta, delta equals one and two already appeared in the literature. Okay, thank you.